Hello everyone and welcome to the Brunton Bugle, the number one place to get your kinetic fix in the podcast world. I'm Lee Rooney. And I'm Mike Booth. And I'm Dan McLennan. A big reality check for the Blues as Exeter dominate, but only snatch a narrow win at Brunton Park. We look back on the defeats of the Grecians while looking ahead to a bumper Easter schedule with games against Walsall and Mansfield Town. Third time lucky we got there in the end, didn't we, lads? Um, I, I, I didn't realise I had that much time. <laughs> At the end, I was like, oh, there's a bit of silence there. I made it a bit shorter because we had two, two names to fit in because, of course, it's three of us this week in our 99th episode that we're putting out. 99. We've got 99 problems, but d- <laughs> if ain't one. I've got a problem now because I'm going to have to beat that <laughs> out. So thanks very much for that, Dan. Um, <laughs> there you go. One minute in and I've already got to put the uh, the clown car noise on. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all back on the pod for the first time in quite a while, I think, actually, to be fair. And for me and Dan, it's weird because we didn't go at the game this weekend and Mike did. We, we, you were busy sunning yourself Ooh, in no. Turkey, weren't Both you? Both part-timers, aren't you? Oh, yeah, exactly, Ooh. exactly. You, you were busy sunning yourself in Turkey, weren't you, Dan? You enjoyed your holiday? Yeah, lovely, thanks. Yeah, I had, a, I had a nice time eating plenty of sausage in Germany. That's not a v- euphemism for anyone uh, <laughs> right in saying so. But I, I had a lovely time out of the Berlin derby, except for the result. Bloody Union Scheisse winning the uh, the game, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was incredible being, being back at a football game that big with a full house of 75,000 there. And the atmosphere was pff, something else. But I mean, it, it, it's funny because... Just going off a little bit on a tangent here, but obviously Hertha lost the game 4-1 against their big city rivals. And at the end of the game, the fans all come over to the Oscar behind the, the goal to, you know, sort of say sorry and applaud the fans. One of the ultras, or a couple of the ultras come out of the stand and basically demanded the players take off their shirts and leave them on the running track behind the goal in front of the fans as an apology, <laughs> saying you're not fit to wear the shirt. It was a bit like, this is this is a bit much, isn't it, really? But that's that's the way football fans react on the continent sometimes, isn't it? I Let's have more of this. At the Warwick Road end. They yeah. can hang, hang them up on that little stick they put the um, the GoPro yeah. on or something like that. Maybe do a bit more of that uh, for future defeats. We're not having too many of them at the moment. Not Certainly not bad defeats at the very least, anyway. Um, well, let's get into it because we've got a bit to fit in. Um, should we start with the loan updates? You want to go through this one for us, Dan, this week? Yeah, uh, it's uh, getting a little bit quieter. Mm. Uh, Taylor Charters got back to winning ways with Gateshead at the weekend. 4 3 victory over Chester. It seemed to be a hell of a game this looking mm. at the uh, the scorers. More than the goal scorers in the X Files, but uh, Charters started again at left back. Uh, was subbed off around the hour with the uh, heat free top at that point. Mm. And it's, uh, it's still tight as with Brackley at the top, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Because Brackley, I think they got a win against York, didn't they? But I think that they were lucky because last week, I think. Um... Gateshead drew, didn't they? But also Brackley drew as well. So it was, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's going to go down to the wire that one, isn't it? Um, it'd be interesting to see if anyone else slips up for the end of the season. I think I've looked at the run-ins of both teams. I think Gateshead is slightly more favourable, but not, there's not a huge amount in it. I think. Yeah. I have a feeling that Brackley have got to play a couple more of the teams that are in the promotion run, basically going for the playoffs. Mm. So could be interesting to see what happens there. And then. Uh, the, the Carlisle Loney Derby. Do you want to tell us about that one? <laughs> yeah. Grimsby travelled to uh, the south coast to take on Weymouth. And uh, our two Loneys, uh, Abrahams and Mampala, got a combined three minutes of football. <laughs> uh, Mampala was on in the 89th minute as a sub, while Abrahams came on in the uh, 90th minute. It was a ball draw, wasn't it? Yeah, it's one of those ones I think I'd imagine where basically both clubs are making subs at the same time. So actually they both came out at the same time and one yeah, was in the 89th yeah, yeah, and one was yeah. into the 90th. But uh, yeah, but, yeah. But, Grimsby's... but no, Grimsby yeah. are just in the playoff spots mm. while Weymouth are pretty much gone now, aren't they? So... Yeah, 11 points adrift in 22nd place. I mean, they're de facto bottom of the league, aren't they? Because Dover have been gone since pretty much the first game with yeah, their 12-point yeah. deduction. Um so yeah, there you go. Um, news-wise, there's not really a huge amount else to talk about. The reserves played a game against Stockport, lost two 0 obviously in midweek. That was yeah, just... it was just minutes for those that haven't really played much recently. Uh, yeah, 
Interesting to see the yeah. the young lads obviously were previously suspended. They uh, were um, involved in that game, so uh, yeah, looks like they've that's, been, that's reintegrated. been done and dusted now, yeah. hasn't it? So. Yeah. Interesting to note they uh, they lost they've lost the league now. They they they're going to finish. It looks like second because Preston have secured top spot, which is frustrating, isn't it? When those three lads get suspended and they would have played in that game against Preston, where we only lost one nil, and if we win that game. The title's on for them, isn't it? So I think Preston are quite strong at the moment, though, because are, I know yeah. we played them in a reserve game and yeah. their reserve team was ridiculously strong. Yeah. And those youths that do play for their reserves had a little step up maybe from one or two of ours. Yeah. But, but it's one of the ones, and, and we, we didn't put out a weak team. Well, you know, yeah, we, put a... we put a relatively strong team ourselves. So, you know, for them to tank us... In such a fashion, it yeah. doesn't look good for us either. But you know. yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a learning curve for those young lads, isn't it? Though getting get themselves suspended and basically potentially costing their team a chance of the title, really, because we it did weaken us. Even though we we only lost one nil, you think you have a fish burn in there and a bolado, you, you might well win that game. You might nick it. So frustrating for them. There you go. Um, I don't think there's any other bit of news. Other than obviously, you, you spotted the news about the the start of next season as well. Yeah, uh, obviously the EFL have uh, announced their dates for next season and it's a July start for the mm. uh, EFL. Uh, obviously, World Cup season. Not often that happens because it's normally in the summer. But the uh, the season start regular is the 30th of July. Fixtures come out first of the 23rd of June. Date for your diaries, 9am as usual. Mm. And the final day of the season is the 6th of May, 2023. Yeah. And the playoff finals are on the usual late bank holiday May weekend in 2023. Uh, League 2, Saturday 27th of May. So if yeah. anyone fancies reserving the hotels... You For know. no reason at all. Um, <laughs> the way things are going. Because we'll have won it, you see. Of course, <laughs> of course. But I mean... It, it, it... The League Two doesn't actually stop, does it, for the season? The Championship does stop for about. Championship has about. I think, three weeks. I think it covers the group games and second round. Yes. Games and then obviously it's unless you've got four or five, you're not going to get your yeah. game off type thing. Yeah, exactly. It's a. Uh, it's luckily looking at the fixtures, it doesn't look like England have got any games that clash with the season. Do uh, with the. Uh, with the, the what would be the League Two games, would they? So, no, and most I'm, of the England kickoffs are seven pm, I think. And I think as well, there's the FA Cup roundabout then as well, isn't it? The second round yeah. of those weekends, so that that might be interesting to see how that works out. Whether they look to get all those games to kick off quite early on those days, maybe to give people time to go and watch the matches. Um, but yeah, I think that's it news wise at the moment, isn't it? I think so. Let Let's get on to uh, the to Mike section as it is this week. Uh, the <laughs> the match review. So yeah. Uh, United nil excess of one. Uh, I, I said in the intro, I, th- I think it it's a big learning curve for how far we've actually got to go, isn't it? This result. I think you look at it and you think, okay, we're playing second in the league. Second in the league, we're in incredible form. I could be in better form than in Forest Green for quite a while because they've managed to claw back quite a bit. They're still five points behind them, but it, it's one of those ones where I think even Simpson was looking at it and thinking, well, this shows how far we've actually got to go as a club because they've been setting themselves up over the last four or five seasons, Exeter, whereas we have the these phases where we have one season good, one season rebuild, sort of bad, one season good, don't quite make it good. And you see what I mean? Whereas Exeter have sort of mm. been consistently top 10, haven't they, for, for quite a while now. And and it, clearly it showed in this game, Mike. I mean, you were there. What, what, what's your initial thoughts on, on, on the result and the performance? Yeah, I mean, Exeter were by far the better team. Um, and it was, but it was one of them that's quite disappointing because... I'd go as far to say the goal we conceded, I'd put in the top five softest goals that we've conceded this mm. season. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not taking anything away from Exeter. Mark Howard was our man of the match and it was one of them yeah. games where he had to make a string of really good saves. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just a bit disappointing, but we didn't really threaten them at all, to be honest. Um, there's one notable moment that I'd like to mention um, that, you wouldn't have seen the highlights where we were on the attack. And I think Gibson was our furthest player forward. If not, he was maybe second or third furthest player forward. Mm. And then Exeter countered and they had a player one on one. And it was Gibson who was back to make the tackle, mm. which is like, that's what you'd see from John Mellish as, as a centre forward, yeah. which, you know, it's good to see. And, 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 he, and his body language as well, Gibson, he sort of, when it got to about sort of 60 minutes and, 
it was still sort of nil nil. He sort of his body language. It was like, well, someone needs to make a difference here, and he, he was. You could tell he was backing himself to be that sort of catalyst. Obviously, it didn't work out, but you know, earlier in the season we had it where players didn't want to stand up and be counted when they were mm. needed, and it's nice that we have players that are willing to do that now. Yeah, Gibson's an interesting one. We've mentioned in recent weeks haven't we, how we think he can be a big player for his next season, whether that's on the wing or whether that's as a number 10 who roams about a bit. We'll have to wait and see. But I did actually watch a lot of the game. Uh, I managed to find, uh, managed to get our eye follow um, over in Germany. So I was sat there on the S-Bahn train towards going to the game with all these Germans looking at me like, what on earth is he watching on, on his <laughs> mobile there? <laughs> but um, So I saw a decent chunk of it. I missed the goal because we just couldn't get a single one to go anywhere near the, the ground. Um, in terms of the chances, I mean, we had one decent chance, I think, that I can remember. That was one from Mella, wasn't it, where he showed good footwork in the area. Yeah. Dawson tipped Everyone over. was just screaming, shoot, 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 and he took forever to I, I think to he did the, the right thing off. to get him get his feet you know, oh, yeah. sorted out and, and get a shot away. But you mentioned how good Howard was. Tell us about that save he made that was low down by his feet. We've seen the footage of it now, and I saw it at the time, and I was like, wow, how has he got to that? I mean, 37 years old, brilliant yeah. agility, get himself down and make a save. I mean, the, the GoPro footage, to be honest, makes it look easier it's a for slower, him. slower, doesn't it? It, it doesn't yeah, look quite as difficult. Yeah, and it makes it look like the ball was almost hit right at him. But at, oh. at the time, you know, phenomenal save. And, and not just that, so I think he managed to turn it around the post. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and not put it back into the, the danger zone. Um, yeah, fantastic save. Um, and he, he made a couple of others as well, like I say. Um, it's just a, a shame that the goal that we conceded was, was so soft. A couple of people have pinned the blame on Mellish, maybe. I mean, for me, it's your cent- central defenders need to be marking the centre forward. And it's hard to pin one player the blame on one player because there's a few that should have been doing a lot better. It's difficult. You can't really work out from the goal whether it's man marking or zonal marking. It's, it's hard mm. to tell. If it's, if it's zonal, maybe you could pick Mellish out. But I, I mean, I think I think Dan, you sort of mentioned. I think it was you. I can't remember. Maybe it wasn't that. Maybe Roberts was the one who was possibly slightly at fault for the goal. Maybe. No, it wasn't me. Oh, it wasn't you then. Oh, well, there you go. So, <laughs> someone else. Someone else said to me maybe I can't remember who, but basically. <laughs> It did it, it, it kind of look like he was a little bit caught ball. I think, to be honest, I think pretty much the whole defence was caught ball napping at that point, wasn't there, really? I don't think you can pick it on one player. Someone yeah. should have taken charge, really. Maybe Mellis should have done, maybe Robert should have done, I don't know. But, yeah, it's a soft goal, isn't it? And I think, as a keeper at Howard, will be frustrated as well, the fact that his defence have just given him no hope at saving that so late in the game as well. And look like one of those days, really, where it just didn't work. I mean... Christian Dennis was taken off at half time. Mike was he? He didn't look quite in the games he had done in recent weeks. No, he didn't. And sort of him and Patrick, you know, they've both demonstrated a bit of, you know, they can both hold the ball up, but they just couldn't at all. Mm. Like the the ball just was not sticking at that end of the pitch. Um, and obviously, I'm a big fan of both of them, but it just it wasn't it wasn't working for for either either of them. Sadly. Um, at the other end of the pitch, um, McDonald was probably our worst player. He mm. just wasn't very good. And him and Dickinson, they just don't have an understanding. They, they were kind of bickering a, a little bit a couple of times um, about, you know, when someone had got inside in that sort of their right wing position about whose who's fault it was kind of thing. And it's not quite the understanding that we've seen Mellish and Armour have together when they're playing in them roles. Yeah, it's a fair point, that, to be fair. I mean, uh, interesting one that Armour didn't feature again, Dan. I mean, doesn't sound like he's injured, does it? It sound like he's just giving him maybe a little break from the team. It's something that we suggested maybe. You, you spoke about it before. He's still, what, 2021? 20, he's still a young lad, isn't he? And maybe that's a yeah. good, good thing to take he's, him out the front Like I said, he's, he's played twice as much football as, for instance, Taylor Charters has at yeah. our level. You know, uh, it, it's been a long season, you know. Three managers, he's, he's probably just burned out a little bit, to be quite honest. And hmm. you know, I have seen mentioned a couple of times through the season that he's still growing. You know, yeah. So, and I also think eventually he'll become our left-sided centre back, which I've said several times. But that's stick a little bit further down the line. You're sticking to that one, aren't you? You determined. To yeah, yeah. To push that one forward. I think with his height, that's all. 
Yeah, he's a bit, he's a big lad. He's very good on the ball as well. I think that's that's one thing mm. as well. He's not he's not exactly the paciest, is he, Jack? He's not slow, but he's not someone who's got you know bearing bearing searing pace yeah, to, yeah. to get away from. Someone. Which is which is why I think he will sort of switch inside. I actually mm. think he. I know Mellish plays left centre back at the moment, mm. but uh, I actually think it would suit Armour because while he's not the paciest, he can have a little burst if you know what I mean, and you know. You almost wonder if Melish would do quite well as the middle centre back, really, if because that role working as a sweeper might actually work, work quite well for him. It allows him to get forward a little bit as well as being, you know, being the one who winning all the stuff in the air as well at the back. So, be interesting to see what happens, how that develops over the next couple of seasons. Um, yes, yeah, so, so you mentioned there that Dickinson you talked about there, Mike. Um, he, again, it looked to me like he, he was struggling, but obviously he had that in knock. From what Simpson said, he is fit to play this weekend if needed. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a weird one, isn't he, Dickinson? Because he's clearly got some ability about him. You know, when he when he when he's on his game, he's a he's a really good player at this level. We've never quite seen that for him, have we? Yeah, we've played him in quite a few positions now mm. as well, and we we just haven't seemed to seem seem to get the best out of them out of him. And it wouldn't surprise me if he's one of them who we let go of in the summer, and he signs for another club in this league and does really well. Mm. Good. Because for whatever reason, it just hasn't really clicked from here. But it was interesting. I remember earlier in the season, I think you were speaking to the Colchester fans, and yeah. he was saying that some of their fans have Dickinson in like their best ever eleven kind of thing. <laughs> you, you know, and he's it's fair to say that he's nowhere near that level for us. Like, but no. yeah, it's an odd one. Like you say, he obviously does have ability, but we just can't seem to get the best out of him. Yeah, it's... I, I was going to say with Dickinson as well, uh, folks say, oh, he's injured a lot. Yes, he was last season. He's played 34 games this season. Mm. And, mm. you know, he's only really had one spell, which was sort of February, where he wasn't in the team. He's had the odd game here and there, but he's he's been available for most of our games this season. So, yeah. you know. And it's like you said, Dan, as well, before that, you know, or oh, Mike, sorry, as well. He's played so many different positions. He's never been able to settle in a position. I think he's actually done okay when he's played in that centre midfield role. You know, it's, uh, some people have pointed out he's quite a big, bulky lad, actually, isn't he? He was never seemed to be that big and bulky when he was at Colchester in the past. Mm. He's like he's, he's he's tried to you know build up his muscle, and with that, you lose a bit of your pace, don't you? Because you are carrying a bit more weight with the muscle, so it can be tough sometimes, can't you? You've got to sort of balance that thing. But yeah, he's one again. Thanks, uh, thanks. Can I just interject? Thanks to Lee Rooney for our body lesson this week. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I'm not an expert on the on the matter. Well, I'm I'm not an expert on muscles. Let's put it that way. Um, but but yeah. So yeah, I, I can agree with you, Mike. I could see him going somewhere else in the summer and actually doing all right there. <laughs> and we'd be like, well, why don't we see a player like that with us? Sometimes it just doesn't work out. Mm. That's just the reality of the situation, isn't it? It just it happens sometimes. Um, yeah, in, in terms of the rest of the team, also you mentioned Gibson did quite well there. Patrick not quite in it. I mean, Torre and Show Silver came on, just couldn't quite get into the game either, really, either of them. Yeah, I mean, T- Torre had a little bit uh, sort of down the paddock touchline, you know, obviously attacking the road mm-hmm. end down the right, and he was doing his quick feet, and it was getting people quite excited. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, it's nice to see that he's sort of getting a, a look in again, because we all know what a good player he can be, and it was obviously the extra away fixture last season where he did that headbutt and he just <laughs> never really bounced back from that, did he? No. That seemed to be a real turning point for him, which, which is, is a shame. And I think people forget what a good player he was up until that moment as well. I think obviously he had that and then there was the issue with the fact that there was lockdowns, he couldn't go back to visit his family in France yeah. and stuff like that. And, it, and it, clearly that's something he's been able to do when he's been in other clubs. You know, you can, you can, you can, if you're in London based... You can fly over to London, can't you? And you can be back, you know, by Monday morning, basically for mm. training, can't you? So it's, he's not being able to, have that, able to have that opportunity. So again, he's one that we're, we're fairly certain is probably going to be leaving in the summer. But you know, it, it's his chance to impress other people, basically, isn't it? At the moment, really. again, like I say, I would not be surprised if he came back to bite us on the arse, playing for someone else, and looked like a much better player for it. Yeah, I could, I could see that happening. Really, um, yeah. In terms of the rest of the team, Mellish in midfield again. I mean. Your thoughts on that? I think he does okay there. I don't think he's anywhere near as bad as people make him out to be in midfield, but no. he's much better as a left centre-back, isn't he? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, like like I said before, McDonald looked poor 
you know the three in fact i said it in the in the pre-match you know that the three have having Simeo, feeney and mellish as if the three they've got such a good understanding together and we're losing that and at the same time you know we, we are a bit injury hitting midfield um divine was a little bit chris billy-esque in some ways in that mm. he won the ball well a couple of times but then just gave it away again <laughs> um yeah, it's, uh, it's. But yeah, we, we, with Mellish, I think it's just the case, isn't it? Really, of the fact that you know we 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 just it needs muscle, the moment, isn't it? Basically, we're just yeah. putting him in there to fill a role, essentially, aren't we? Um, interesting point in the post match, Dan, and there's a couple of other points that Simo's made over the last few days that I wanted to discuss. Um, first up, he, he mentioned the fact that he, he didn't feel the players believed in themselves ahead of this game, did they? Which is interesting because. It, in the other games, they look like they've believed they can get results, haven't they? And it, it seems in this one, they just because Exeter got off to such a quick start and because they're doing so well in the league, they, they never really thought we could get something from this game. I think they've just thought we're up against a good team here. You know, yeah. we'll go, it's it's going to be a hard afternoon. But we've we've come against other teams that have been in second or third when we've mm. played them and, and we've beaten them. You know. Yeah, is there a suggestion that maybe that they, they, they don't believe Simpson's going to be manager next season? And do they think, well, who are we playing for here? We don't even know who the boss is going to be. We, you know, he's either going to be the one who decides whether we stay in the summer, or you know, that that that, that we're in a re- we're in a really difficult zone right now, aren't we? In that Simpson's very clear that he didn't want to discuss anything until the end of the season. Then he sort of rode it back a bit to say, you know, when we're safe, we can start maybe looking into it. We're more or less safe now, aren't we? Because let's be honest, Stephen and Oldham and Bar- are not all going to get enough results to overtake us. They're not. It's just not going to happen. Mm. <laughs> no. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Um, well, no, we're ten points ahead of us. So that's that's four four wins with five games. All to go, three of them right? are not going to win four games, are they? No, no, they're not. So we're safe, pretty much. Not officially, but we po- we possibly will be by Monday. You'd imagine. Um, so we're in a situation where we haven't got anyone like as a director of football anymore because of he who shall not be named has gone, thank God. Uh, we've got no one in place to actually decide who's going to be staying next season because obviously Simpson, quite rightly, doesn't want to be saying, well, I don't want anyone who decides whether people stay and then I'm going to be gone in a few weeks. It's been brilliant the last few weeks getting ourselves in this position, but we're now in a real crossroads, aren't we? Of well, what, what do you do here, Dan? Because it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because there's players out there who are obviously playing for their careers, but they're in a situation where they're thinking, well, the manager's not necessarily going to be here to decide I stay anyway. It's tough. Mm. And any incoming manager likely isn't aware that they're incoming at the moment. You yeah. Know? yeah, there's no way they're, going to be, they're not going to be speaking to anybody else as long as they've got a chance to keep Simpson. Basically. Because if you remember when Keith Kerr left, he actually helped shape the list, didn't he? Which was yeah. utterly bizarre. And then we didn't pick John Sheridan up till quite late for the mm. pre season, you know. Yeah. And uh, there is there is sort of echoes of that sort of situation potentially happening again. The debt issue continues to be the big problem, doesn't it? That, yeah, that's that's where the the big millstone around the club remains. In. And he's going to remain for quite a while until until Philip Day comes out of his nest and actually tells us what he wants to do. The club haven't heard him from him or put pure pay for ages, have they? And and it's, yeah. it's crippling us. He's, he's been in the area in recent weeks. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. But got... but doesn't answer the phone or pop in. I I, I just don't get why he's he's, he's he's thinking it. Surely he can say, if, if he's really interested still in potentially taking over the club, God knows why, because he's shown no interest in, in the club before, really. Then surely you see an opportunity. Well, you've got Paul Simpson here, someone who the fans love. Potentially the club actually can make some money over the next couple of seasons when fans turn out for a manager that's popular. You can get the team playing well. There's a big a little there. bit, and, you know, you could be up there with, you know, bigger crowds. It's, it's it's just it's just baffling. It, it, it's just it's Carlisle United, isn't it? Oh, it, it sums it up, isn't it? You've you you ride that crest of a wave, but you've you've got to come back down again, don't you? That's, that's yeah. the problem at the moment. Interesting comment as well that I've just seen um, Paul Newton tweet about uh, this afternoon. Um, they're going to be on uh, BBC Cumbria tomorrow morning. We're recording on Wednesday evening here. Um, that um, he's basically said here in, in his tweet, Paul, strong words 
from Paul Simpson at today's media briefing on coming in to find no recruitment process in place at the football club. Fair to say he wasn't impressed. <laughs> now, obviously, we know that, um, what's his name, left on the same day as Millen. But if him going means there's no recruitment process in place, and he then claimed he wasn't the one who found the place, it was the manager. What on earth has been going on at this club for the last two or three years? It almost seems, and this sounds insane when you think about it, <laughs> but it almost seems like when Simpson took over last time, the club was actually in a better state in in some ways. We had a chief scout then. Yeah. We don't have a chief scout now. Yeah, we've got an analyst. Well, we've got an analyst now, I suppose. That's what. That's one thing. But it's a different sort of time, isn't it? Really, I suppose. And it's it's something I've mentioned many times, not just on the pod, but in our you know general chats and matches. And it, as as I've said before, I am a fan of a director of football. I think it's part of the modern game. The, the director of football and the head coach. You know, the old style of management doesn't really exist now. But apart from that. We should at least have two full-time scouts, one covering the north of England and one covering Scotland. That yeah. is a basic, basic thing for that we should have. Yeah. And then you, you know, you if you wanted someone from maybe the Midlands, you either get the north one to go further, a bit more expenses, or you get a trusted, a trusted eyes and ears to run a rule for you. You know. Yeah. Your director of football can do a lot of that. They can go and do lots of watching game stuff. I'll tell you one thing: our director of football never went to watch a single game, did he? Well, we, we know that. We've, we've been told that of people. Yeah, mm. we've been told that you for know. a fact, which is embarrassing. He's, he, like we said this before. He was a glorified go-between man, an agent almost. It was, it was a ridiculous situation we we're in. Um, I mean, and, realistically, no, no, no. your scout should never be watching us. You, sc- you no, know, no, exactly. at, at three o'clock yeah. on a Saturday, your scout should be at another game exactly. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you they don't... should be at games on Tuesday and Wednesday night, even if it's just under twenty threes or yeah. you know non-league or. Yeah, that's what yeah. your director of football should be in. He should be overseeing the youth recruitment and the youth setup. He should be overseeing the recruitment for the first team and the you know analysis and analysis and stuff like that. And and he I, should be I the know, one with the report too. I know we're going a bit off tangent with this chat, but. As you just said there, a true director of football operates the entire football side of the club. Yeah. That's that's first team, youth team, and academy. And the three sort of bosses of us, so your head coach, your youth team manager, and your academy manager, all report back to him. Yeah. You know, that's... I mean, I, I, I could draw it up in a, in a chart of how it should work, and I'll guarantee you our club was nothing like that. Yeah, but at the, at the same time, if the club was in a better state off the field, I get the vibe that Simo would want full control himself as manager because that's how he is. Oh yeah, and, and that, that's all right having someone like him who could do because he's an experienced coach and he knows it. And he, he, to be honest, he he de facto be head coach and director of football at the same time. He'd be yeah. comfortable doing both those roles. A lot of the up and coming young coaches aren't as comfortable with that. They they want to just be concentrating on the training ground moulding the team and they want someone else to do all the other issues I think Simpson's much more comfortable with that but on top of that I'd imagine Paul Simpson would probably want an extra first team coaching because he had remember back when he was manager here he had an assistant in Dennis Booth and his first team coach in Billy Barr you know yeah. he also had two physios de facto because I think Jeff Hoff used to help out quite a bit with the first team stuff as well you know there's, there's other bits he's, he's been around longer now Simpson that he knows how well run clubs run so there's probably other staff he wants He's made it very clear that there needs to be an improvement in the training facilities and stuff like that. I, I genuinely don't... I, I'm not sure the debt thing is as big an issue. I think it probably still is a little bit, but he wants all the other things sorted out, but we can't do that until the debt issue is resolved. That's the problem, that the two things are interlinked, aren't they? Unless that's solved. At the same time, though, as the recent account showed, we do have money at the bank. Yeah, but then... It's and, it's, it's, and, then it's, and I know you keep X amount for rainy day problems... Mm. But at the same time, you've got to speculate to accumulate at times, you know. Yeah. It's, it's okay having the money in the bank, but if it's just sat there, when you could maybe use a, a, a lump of it mm. to possibly help the club progress, which in turn will pay for itself. Yep. For instance, I mean, this is getting completely off tangent now, but who's the commercial manager at Carlisle United? Um, 
I mean, I know Jenny was doing it for a while, wasn't she? She's doing helping out there. She's not a full time, was... full time bona fide commercial manager, though, is she? No, she covers the shop and a bit of sponsorship and a bit of this. Yeah. There's no pay the money six grand a year for a proper commercial manager, and he'll make double that a season. You know, yeah. we we know people who sponsor Which... the club before who who tell us they've had frustrations trying to actually pay the sponsorship yeah. to the club. Yeah. They've actually got to yeah. go or beg them, say, take the actually take the money because that's yeah. how badly organised it was. Check, checks not getting cash. I know, I know checks are rarely used now. It would be an online payment yeah. now, but you know, checks just never getting cashed, and you know, it's it's incredible. Well, that's that's probably, all. This is probably for the end of season wider. Yeah, look yeah. at the club. But I, I think it's yeah. definitely something worth talking about in this sense because I yeah. think I I do think a performance like that at the weekend you could say potentially is linked to that feeling of okay we've got ourselves to safety now we're a bit at a bit of a plateau because the players are like well is he going to be here next season is it you know what's going to be happening it's it's a really difficult situation isn't it it's it's uh, it, it's frustrating but I mean overall Mike your thoughts just to wrap it up in terms of the extra thing it was just one of those games where the better team you know it, it, I suppose we could have looked at it if, if they'd held on for a couple more minutes you would have said that's a heroic point that against a very very good team wouldn't you yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, like I say, it was one of the softest goals that we've conceded this <laughs> yeah. season, which kind of puts more of a dampener on it. You yeah. know, if it was like an unstoppable thunderbolt or something, you'd be like, fair enough. You know, yeah. it's it's just a little bit more annoying when it's, it's such a soft goal to concede. But one final thing that I, I do want to mention is I uh, tried the uh, chip van on the back of mm-hmm. the paddock before the game. Yeah. And it's fantastic. Yeah, I, I had it earlier this season. I have, I'd say yeah. I approve. Very good. I mean, I'll tell you what, one thing is one of the things that the club's done brilliantly this season. You can't fault that. I think yeah. the way they've improved that is great. I think they should look at what Tron may have done to take it to the next step, basically. Something like mm. that at Burnham Park would be perfect. And I think you'd find people using it all the time. I, I do genuinely think so. So, yeah. Top marks them for that. Uh, before we move on, actually, to the second half, one thing I have to point out, a, a revelation in the uh, CUSG notes, wasn't it, Dan, I think, for this week in the uh, um, the meeting, the notes, was that uh, are we going to be our kit makers again next season? <laughs> Joy of joys. A, a lovely parting gift, I have no doubt, from our uh, our former illustrious, he sh- who shall not be named, director of football. Why he was doing that job, I don't know, but... Yeah. I mean, genuinely one of the worst kit makers we've had, and I, I'll stand by that. I genuinely I think, was at I the think club some of the Sondigo kits were better than theirs. Genuinely. I was at the club shop uh, before I went on holiday. I bought the blue home shorts and the red keeper shorts because I was, I was out football shorts for wearing around the house. And I bought a pair of the travel shorts, shorts with yeah. like zip pocket type things. Yeah. The I'm, 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 I'm no supermodel, you know, I'm a big lad. <laughs> The club shorts fit absolutely perfectly. The leisure shorts, you were lucky if I'd have got one leg in them. How the sizing can be so different on the same size is, you know. The kits are appalling for the size as well. I've been mean, talking to a lad the other day at the, the training yeah. game, Mark, who listens to the podcast as well from Leeds. And he was saying, like, he has to wear XXLs. And he's not an XXL. He's not triple XL. But because of the weird size that they have, that's the smallest you could find to fit it. And they, and they, as well as that, they have the the club crests on the shirts are not sewed on, they're iron on ones, and they they come off mm. after a couple of washes. It just just really bad tatty quality thing. If Cambridge United can get Hubble, why can't we? That that's what I'll always say, and I'll, I'll keep saying that. I think I've ranted enough about that one. We'll have to I go. I know people who have worked in and around the kit industry, yeah, and I myself not blowing any trumpets could probably land us better kit suppliers with two phone calls than what we've had in the last few years. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely indeed. Right, that's the first half of the show done. A good, good little chat, I think that was, I think it's fair to say. Mm. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute and we'll be covering the Walsall and Mansfield games. This is John Mellish, you listen to the Brunton Bugle. Okay, so we're back for the second half of the show. Uh, reminder that you can subscribe to the podcast on all good podcast apps, Apple, Google, 
Acast, Spotify, anywhere like that. If you can give us a review on any of those as well, that'd be fantastic. If you subscribe to the podcast, every time a new episode comes out, it'll go straight into your little inbox and you'll be able to listen to us on the go. Um, also, you can follow us on social media at Brunner Bugle on Twitter. We're on Facebook, search for Brunner Bugle and click like. We're also on the Be Just and Fear Not Facebook group. We're on the um, the Cummings.net message board. And also, you can email us, Bugle at gmail.com. Uh, the second half of the show this season has been sponsored by the Kai United Sports Club London Branch. The London Branch is open to all Kai United fans. They've got members from Cornwall to Dundee and Houston, Singapore, and of course, every part of London and the South East. They regularly meet up on away trips as well as arranging many social events and sports games and fundraising for the club. They'll be providing us with information for the away games as part of the preview section of the season two. You can find out more about the London Branch at their website, carlolondonbranch.org. Now, Simon did send me the pub for this week. Uh, we, we, we missed out for a game recently, didn't we? I think, uh, Dan, I think it might be Tramway, actually. We didn't quite get it in time. Um, so, yeah, uh, Simon says there's a distinct lack of pub, pub options for Walsall, unfortunately, because obviously the, the social club at the ground's gone, isn't it? That used to be a great place to go. Mm. It's, it's not been there for a while now. Um, he's recommended the Park Inn on Bescott Crescent, which is a, a WS1 4SE for the fans travelling by train via Birmingham. Uh, they'd also recommend that's, the per- ba- that's basically the hotel round the corner from the ground essentially the is, yeah, there. Uh, basically yeah. and uh, they'd also uh, if anyone travelling by tr- uh, train via Birmingham they'd recommend the post office vaults at uh, 84 New Street in Birmingham uh, is a good place to go as well so that's the pub recommendations for this weekend's game um, I'm going down with Craig and me and Craig are going to find that pub mic that we went in that did curries <laughs> hopefully uh, just to wind up our mate Johnny who said it's one of the best curries he's ever had it's funny enough it's a big thing in the west midlands yeah a lot yeah, of uh pubs are owned by indian and pakistani families uh yeah. one of my mates lee who listens to mm. us there uh, he's always sending me snapchats of his <laughs> uh sunday lunch beat massive sizzling platters and lovely I, uh, I need to go down and try one i think lovely stuff right well before we do the uh behind enemy lines section dan i understand you have got the question for us this week for beard mike yeah, well, uh, Lee messaged me approximately two minutes before we started recording. <laughs> yeah. Oh, can you be? So my question is: In John Mellish's clip, what cars driving past? No, it isn't really. <laughs> uh, I've had a look through my list of players, and there may be more than one, but I could only find one player who has played for Carlisle, Mansfield, and Walsall. I think I've got it. It's it's an easy question because it's it's not a hard one. Oh, yeah. that's what happens when you give me two minutes notice. Yeah, yeah. So really. I mean, do, do I do I want me to tell you it now or do you want to wait till later? Well, do, to see, see if Mike knows it. Mike, do you Mike, know I, it, Mike? I, I'm struggling, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, give, give give Mike a little time to think of it because okay. I know you'll know it. Yes, I think I know it is. Um, anyway, um, so this week in the Behind Enemy Lines section, uh, we talked to a Mansfield Town fan. We talked to Craig from the Mansfield Matters podcast. Um, really interesting chat with this with Craig. We talked about Mansfield's up and down season, um, whether promotion is actually on this time, having you know spent so much money in recent seasons. Can they finally get themselves up? And, and what Nigel Clough is like as a boss. Um, so here's the chat I had with Craig earlier today. Craig, it's been quite an up and down season for the Stags, it's fair to say. When I was sort of doing a little bit of research ahead of this chat, I, I couldn't believe, I completely forgot that you'd been in 23rd position at one point this season, but you've also been up as high as third place. I mean, how confident are you, you can keep that current form you've got at the moment up and actually get promotion, whether that's through finishing the top three or in the playoffs at the end of the season? I mean, I always get called a pessimist on our podcast, Lee, so to be <laughs> honest, um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I think our form has been been good we've dropped off a little bit of late but we've got enough quality within the squad to do it I think we're just sort of preparing for a potential playoff finish uh, now although you know looking at the the running of teams in and around us Port Vale especially over this Easter weekend play both Hartlepool and Bristol Rovers so a tough uh, weekend for them and then the final two games of the season for them they've got Newport at home and extra away so our running is sort of favourable especially when you consider that three of our last four games are at home where we've been fantastic this season currently on an 11 game winning streak uh, at home a, a brand new club record there so there's certainly an optimism about the place Nigel Clough plays his cards close to his chest he always s- tries to stay ground and sort of say look we take it one game at a time and we are where we are but uh, the more games that we play and the, the closer the finishing line comes the, the optimism certainly raises and uh, 
Uh, obviously, we're speaking ahead of Good Friday at the minute where we're playing Sutton United at home and mm. we're expecting it to be a, an absolute sellout. So uh, there's certainly an anticipation building. Yeah, it's just you say your form dropped off a bit. I was just checking it. The only defeat you've had in the last mm. six was against Forest Green, and I don't think there's any particular shame in that, is there? I suppose in in that sense. But um, just talking about in terms of like your, your the club itself. I mean, there's been a lot of investment in the squad by your owner over recent years, hasn't there? And I think there's a feeling of you've you've under underachieved a little bit in that time. How frustrating has it been that you've not really, not really, to be honest, you've never really got close to promotion, have you? In those those years where the money's been going in. Uh, yeah, we have. Um, in a couple of seasons ago, we we finished fourth. We lost out on promotion on the final day of the season at MK Dons. We needed I a point. Forgot about that one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all right. <laughs> to be fair, we try and forget about it as well because we, like I say, we needed a point for like the last three games, and uh, <laughs> it didn't happen. Then we lost in the playoffs to Newport. But uh, yeah, the inve- in- investment wise, obviously, it, it all sort of stems back to probably six seasons ago now, when a certain Mister Evans was appointed as Mansfield manager, mm. sort of rode in on his on his horse called Paul Rayner, and uh, <laughs> sort of you know brought these players in and, and lifted up, up the ambition and sort of got the owners to spend money. And you know we were very very close to doing it that season, but he walked out for a, a job apparently in P- in uh, in China, which ended up being via Peterborough and Gillingham. <laughs> I'm still think I still think he's waiting for that job in China as well to be yeah. fair but uh, the, that was where the investment was then we we got a manager in David Flickcroft who uh, obviously now director of foot, football at Port Vale who continued to get that investment and built upon the squad which uh, Steve Evans a, a, had built and it, in his first season Flickcroft's first season like I say we finished in, in fourth place lost out on promotion on the final day of the season but the axe was wielded and we appointed the uh, the then youth team manager John Dempster who was a club legend um, former captain, done wonders with the academy to follow Flickcroft and it all sort of went downhill from there and the investment has sort of still been there but I think what a lot of supporters from other clubs don't perhaps realise is that yes whilst John and Carolyn Radford the owners have put the investment into the team and I think it's certainly there mm. clear to see when, it, when you look at the players that we've got actually over the last two seasons or so probably since uh, Covid there's actually been not as much investment there and a lot of it has actually been budget trimming and actually the the squad which we have now which includes the likes of Matty Longstaff on loan from Newcastle United Jamie mm-hmm. Murphy who's played in the SPL Lucas Aikens who's you know played championship is actually a lot cheaper than the squad which we had mm. you know two seasons ago so actually w- Nigel Clough's come in and slashed the budget a little bit got players in who who he knows and who he trusts but uh, is actually spending considerably less than where we were. So actually, um, the investment is still there, yes, but it's actually a lot less than than what it was. So the expectation level is is there, but uh, I think it, it's more about stabilising the club going forward, considering the uh, uh, the way things have gone for us, sort of losing out on promotion and then sort of uh, investing in, in the wrong couple of managers. John Dempster went after a couple of months when it wasn't working for him. We bring in Graham Cochran, who'd only really had a little bit of experience at Bristol Rovers for the wrong reasons. Then COVID hits, it then restarts and Cochran gets off to an absolute woeful start and is sacked after 11 games and Fluff has to do a rebuild job. So there's been a lot of stuff sort of behind the scenes where COVID has sort of impacted a little bit and the the budget has had to be tightened. So uh, it's an interesting one to hear other people's perceptions of it, I think. Mm. You you mentioned Clough there, so we might as well go on to him now. Um, What's the fans' views on him? Because he's someone who who seems to do a brilliant job at the smaller clubs. I mean, the job he did at Burton, I don't Mm. think anyone could deny was incredible on both occasions. When he's gone to slightly bigger clubs, he's always found it a bit tougher, hasn't he? He's never been able to quite have that control that maybe he had at, at Burson. He seems to be getting that now at Mansfield, doesn't he? He seems to have really got a grip at him. I mean, he's certainly brought enough former uh, Burton plays in with him, hasn't he? I think it's fair to say. But <laughs> yeah. no, what, what's the fan views on him? Because I, I think among fa- fans of other clubs, we all appreciate that he's a, he's a really good manager at this level. Mm. But he can be quite a, a difficult character for fans, can't he? I can see that. Um, I can see that. But I think Mansfield fans certainly love him and, and certainly have faith in what he's done. And I think the proof in the pudding is the fact that, you know, you mentioned at the top there about our poor form at the start of the season. We went on a 14 game run without a win, and mm. any other manager at any other club is getting sacked. In today's day and age, they're absolutely getting the P45. They're off down the job centre the next day, aren't they? So, you know, the owners. And the CEO, David Sharp, who's, of course, ex-Wigan, 
uh, grandson of Dave Whelan, um, stuck with Clough and sort of uh, invested in the projects a little bit and trusted the process, and it's sort of panning out for them now. Stags fans love him. They like his enthusiasm. They like the way he is with the players. They like the the way how approachable he is and how he's he's got sort of uh, the the playing staff and, and the squad integrated with the fans again post COVID is sort of a nice little atmosphere bubbling away there as well. But I want to pick up on something you, you sort of said there about what he's done at, at bigger clubs. And actually, I, I I slightly disagree with what you say. I think anywhere that he's been, he's had success. Whether it's been not necessarily measured by trophies on the pitch or promotions, but you look look at the, the clubs he, he's got into and the, the times he went in. He's done a similar job to what he's done at Mansfield. He's got into a club with uh, a lot of playing staff, a lot of you know players on money which they probably shouldn't be on, and, and has had to turn them around and has had to rebuild the squad. He goes into Derby and you know rebuilds a, a decent squad with some young, good young players, brings them through and trims the weight, the wage budget. He does the same at Sheffield United and almost lays the foundations for the success that they went on to uh, to have. So I actually think in terms of managing things off the pitch, wherever he's been, he's sort of had success, and that's why when Mansfield sacked Graham Coughlin after 11 games of uh, last season, the first 11 games where we didn't win at all and we looked doomed to, to get relegated we were picking from three or four managers because there were quite a few out of work at that point and I think we all sort of settled on Nigel Clough looking at what he needed to come in and do and what he does, is he brings a, a good name, a good pedigree and there's a belief there that if we fall short this season, it's fine considering where we've come from this year in terms of that 14 game uh, streak without a win and there's a belief that we'll push on and do it next year. He's a, he's a, a manager who's got that rear factor about him in today's game, which is a support from the back room and that believability factor, that longevity, which you tend not to get in managers nowadays. I mean, we were sort of talking off air, weren't we, before about the amount of managers Carlisle have had this season. Mm. And, and uh, yeah, sometimes you don't get anywhere by chopping and changing. And I think... Uh, uh, a lot of teams would like to perhaps stick with a manager a little bit longer than what they do, and that's what Nigel Clough gives us. And it's a fair point, that to be fair. You look, I'm just looking at his record now. It was 16 years mm. in total at uh, Burton over the two mm. spells. It was four four years at Derby. I mean, two years at Sheffield United. I, I think it was a bit more of a difficult situation there than yeah, at was, Derby, yeah. wasn't it? But, it yeah. but yeah, it does show you someone who sticks around and he likes to build clubs, doesn't he? I suppose that's exactly what Mansell will be looking for, for quite a while. In, in terms of off the field stuff, um, I, I, I seem to remember noticing something a while back about you in, investing in a new training centre as well, especially that seems to be something that was a lot of money going into. Uh, are there any other sort of plans for the club in the future? Because I know obviously when, when you go to Field Mill, the, most of the stands are fairly modern bar the one that's obviously <laughs> condemned. I mean, difficult yeah. for you to do anything on that side of the pitch, I guess, with it being so close to housing. Is there any sort of future plans for the ground or anything? Because I mean, for yourselves as a club, it, it must be tough being so close to Nottingham and Derby and Sheffield, because obviously for us at Carlisle, you know, Barrow's our nearest, well, in fact, Newcastle technically our nearest club at 60 miles, Barrow is a little bit further. We don't really get the, we don't get the experience of that. What's, yeah. what's that kind of like? Yeah, it's a frustrating one because you walk around Mansfield sometimes, especially at like towards the start of the season, yeah. you see people wearing forest shirts and you're thinking, mm, fair enough. But then obviously, you know, success breeds success, doesn't it? So when you're yeah. doing well in your local town, all of a sudden there's extra Mansfield shirts <laughs> out, which is, uh, you know, to be expected. But uh, I think in terms of where we are as a club, we've been growing for a, for a number of years. John and Carolyn Radford, the owners, are, are really, really good. They, uh, you know, support the manager, they support any manager that they've got in there and they support the infrastructure of the club, but they do it with a sensible head on. I mean, they invest a lot of money. They've really turned one core stadium as it's known now into a stadium which people enjoy going to visit home mm -hmm. fans. It, it's a lot brighter. It's a lot better than, than what it was. There are certain things which fans want to see happen. And bringing in David Sharp, actually, um, you know, a couple of seasons ago um, was a masterstroke. John and Carolyn now reside in, in Portugal with their young family, mm -hmm. uh, so they're not on the ground all the time. David Sharp has the is the CEO now. He has the the day to day run of the club, and he's sort of done a sweep of, of what's needed. And he's looking at certain things, you know, ticketing wise, stand wise, match day engagement wise. You mentioned the the the, the infamous Bishop Street stand there. <laughs> There's not a lot that can be done about that because of the houses that are be behind it. I think it's also got. Um, uh, a bit of something in the roof which means it'd be difficult to take down anyway there are certain options or, or whatever which you could do for it but I think what David Sharp and the owners sort of say is 
that's not something which is going to be sorted overnight. It's it's going to be a long job, and if Mansfield want if if fans want to sort of see that come in, then Mansfield are going to have to be a, a sustained league club, league one club for at least two seasons before a thought process is even made on it. To be fair, because yeah, we're getting good crowds at the moment because we're doing well, but as soon as that drops off, it will dip back down to the average, you know, two and a half, three. Yeah, it's, it's tough, isn't it, for for, for clubs at our level? But they, mm. I don't think fans sometimes realise that the step from League One to Championship was huge. It really oh, is huge because there's so many big clubs in League One these days. It, it, mm. You can't just fly through it. We got very close, obviously, when we lost to Leeds in the playoffs in 2008. But truth be told, we've not really got anywhere near it since, which is frustrating. But that's just the reality of football these days. Um, well, let's talk about your squad then quickly before we, we get on to the end here. Um, who are the main men to watch in the squad? I mean, I'm looking through it, there's plenty of experience and good quality in there. You also mentioned oh. Lucas Aikens early and Stephen Elliott. I mean, Matty Longstaff on loan from... Uh, from Newcastle United, incredible signing, rumoured to be one player we were after. But I'd, I'd imagine he'd, he'd rather go for a playoff chase than a relegation battle. Um, George, George Lapsley's another one who's really impressed me every time I've seen him play against you. Who, who would you say are the men to watch out for? Yeah, Reese Oates is the obvious one, top goal scorer, out with a little bit of an injury at the moment, could be back by the time that we uh, come up to you guys on uh, on Bank Holiday Monday, so uh, he's got pace to burn, he runs off the, the shoulder of the last man, he's got energy and uh, runs at defenders and, and causes absolute nightmare and hasn't scored a tap-in yet this season, every goal he's scored has been an absolute worldie, so that, he's always... Uh, uh, one to watch. Interesting you mentioned George Lapsley there. Yeah, he's another player that uh, is quite uh, well thought of with, amongst our fan base. Gets box to box, gets a tackle in, uh, can pick out a pass as well. But the, the main one really um, is Stephen Quinn, who's you know 36 years old, um, ex-Burton, of course, played with Nigel Clough before, played at, at the highest of levels, really experienced player, but he, he plays with the energy and enthusiasm of a, a 21-year-old. He's, he's got that heart he's got that desire and he really really does uh, pull Mansfield on and if you go through it I can't tell you the exact st- start off the top of my head but uh, if you go through it and look at the games that Stephen Quinn has not played for Mansfield when he doesn't play we don't win I think we've actually only won one game without Stephen Quinn which says uh, a lot he's the engine in our <laughs> midfield and uh, the other one in there at the moment is John Joe O'Toole we spoke about our um, you know form when we didn't win the 14 games we bring John Joe O'Toole in and play him at centre half because we didn't have any uh, centre backs that were fixed. We had a couple injured and, and things like that. And uh, O'Toole comes in there, plays there, and uh, does very, very well. And actually, he's another one where when he doesn't play, we really struggle to get results. So uh, those three for me: Oates, O'Toole, and Quinn. But uh, it's also worth keeping an eye on uh, some of our other players uh, in there as well. Danny Johnson obviously scored uh, top scorer last year for, for Leighton Orient. Hasn't really featured uh, too much. Lucas Aikens, but Jordan Bowery as well he can be uh, a bit of a handful we've we've certainly got players with the experience in that squad but uh, it just needs to click we've whilst we're up there at the, the the top end of the table this is why I was saying earlier that our form has been a little bit uh, indifferent we we're, we're really capable of um you know turning teams over and, and getting good results but we're we're also our own worst enemies we make sloppy mistakes and concede uh, sloppy goals which uh, which can be a bit of a, a thorn in our side uh, sometimes and uh, just on the George Lapsley thing as well you guys don't need to worry about him because he'll be serving uh, the, the third of a three game ban oh, when we play well, you, you guys so uh, <laughs> an afternoon off for him well, that, that, that's good to hear um, and that's interesting which I owe till he's one he's one that I, I always he's see, a character he always, <laughs> he always seems to be involved in a disciplinary issues as much as a, <laughs> but he's obviously a quality player to be fair um, well um, I, I don't know, I think, obviously you're expecting a big following to be coming up for this game this weekend I haven't, I haven't seen what the ticket sales have been like for you guys but obviously you know into the running now Easter Monday I'd imagine there'd be a few travelling up yeah, I'd have thought so. I mean, you know, Lake District for a couple of days. You know, you you, <laughs> you travel up on uh, on Saturday morning, don't you, after the the game on Friday, and have a couple of days away. So, uh, yeah, I imagine there'll be a decentish following. Mansfield fans uh, at the moment, obviously, because we're doing well home and away, we we we're, we're taking good numbers away from home, and we've actually just come out of the, the, the spell of a a, 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 a a run where we've had so many away games uh, on the spin. We actually only had one home game and I think nine or ten fixtures, which Blimey. is just ridiculous because of how the fixtures yeah. fell with rearrangements and stuff. But the Stags fans are, are, have supported it wherever we've been and uh, we're always taking over 150, 200. I, I had imagined that there'd be a decent following uh, on Monday given bank holiday and things like that so uh, and, and given our form and I think if we get three points on Friday afternoon against Sutton United and it sort of 
keeps us well within that hunt of uh, you know getting that third place slot. Then that elect that elect that will add extra numbers in uh, as well. Well, Craig, I've kept for you long enough now. Um, let's have your predictions for this weekend's game. Oh, uh, <laughs> I think it, it'd be a tough place to come actually because obviously you guys are doing really well under under Paul Simpson. I've been, I'm quite impressed with with the way he's uh, turned things around for you guys. I I really hope for, for your your guys' sake that you manage to keep hold of him next season. I know there's rumours that if Rooney leaves Derby and Dar- when Derby dropped down, that uh, he might go there, but yeah. uh, which would be a shame for you mm. guys. But uh, it will be a tough place to, to go. I think it will all depend on how we come uh, through Friday. But I'd back us to. To, to sneak a 2 0 win. Greg, thanks for your time and all the best for the final few games after Easter Monday. <laughs> Pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Thanks once again to Craig for giving up his time to speak to us about all things Mansfield Town. So, uh, before we talk about the Mansfield game, let's look ahead to the Walsall game this weekend um, at the Best Scott Stadium on, fr- on weekend. It's Friday. Well, Bank Holiday weekend, isn't it, really? So, it still is the weekend, I guess. Um, the weekend is Saturday or Sunday. Okay. Okay, not even on a bank holiday? Nope. No, no. The dictionary oh, yeah. says the weekend is <laughs> okay. Saturday or Sunday. All right. All right, Samuel Johnson. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, <laughs> let's move on. Um, so, yeah, interesting game this one will be. I mean, remember the game against Walsall towards the end of last season, or in fact, on the last day of last season, was genuinely one of the worst games of football you could <laughs> ever possibly want to see. It actually was. I genuinely can't actually even remember anything that happened from that game. I think Josh Dixon came on and played left wing for a bit, which was a bit weird because he said he was the centre midfielder. We kicked that, off. Yeah. And they kicked off. And that's about it, really. He that's was, about it, yeah. Oh, God awful game, wasn't it, anyway? But there you go. Uh, this weekend, oh, this Friday's re- referee is Martin Woods from Lancashire. It's his first ever game as an EFL referee. Interesting one, this one, because it doesn't Obviously happen. Obviously trying them out for next yeah, season, I would you say. Don't, you don't see that very often, though, do you? Like a, man, a referee coming in. Towards the end of a season to step up to the EFL lesson, unless there's maybe, it's there's maybe just with there being that many games all for the weekend, with, yeah, uh, a few injuries, maybe things like that. You don't yeah. think about referees getting injuries, do you? It's kind of a weird one, but uh, it is yeah. funny when it happens at a game. Oh, it's very, very funny, indeed. <laughs> but he, he's clearly someone to think highly of because he's been a National League referee, but he actually hasn't refereed that many National League games this season because he's been, been doing a lot of the uh Premier League two games. I think so. That that probably explains why. Um, when he has taken charge of National League games and, and FA Cup games and things like that, he's taken charge of 13 games for the season, handing out 42 yellows and two red cards. Head to head wise, it'll be the 63rd meeting between the two clubs. We've won 20, drawn 19, and the Saddlers have won 23. Um, in terms of positions, they're, they're quite steady from this season to last season, aren't they? Down looking at it, 19th last season in League Two. Currently sitting in 18th on 47 points from 41 games. One position, but they're as better than United, but they played the same number of games. They've just got, I think their goal difference is minus 12 and ours is minus 19. So they're ahead of us in that sense, basically. So a win would obviously move us up at least one place this weekend. Manager, Mike Flynn. Interesting mm. one, this one, isn't it, Dan, really, when he got appointed? Because he's, he's someone who, a lot of people were really impressed with the job he did at Newport, weren't they? Obviously, his hometown club, he took them over... Was it three or four seasons ago? I think it was now, and they were looking destined to go out of the league. He'd retired as a player because he had a heart issue. Quite fairly young, wasn't he? Maybe in his early thirties, I think. And he took over. Did he take over from Graham Wesley? Actually, that rings a bell, doesn't it? I think he'd done a pretty awful job. He took over from Wesley, came in, performed a miracle in keeping them up, and then took on the job full time and really rebuilt the club into a one that. He's now a solid League Two club that challenges for promotion every season, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, he's a legend down there. You know, you, yeah. the cup games as well. They had good cup runs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, made beat a lot Leeds, of money for them. And, you know what I'm They beat Leeds, I think, in one of those games, the, I think. They beat a few clubs, you mm. know. And, and when, when they played, was it Man City? I don't think they were overly embarrassed. You know, I mean, mm. Christ, Man City would destroy anyone from our league these days, isn't it? The turn Swindon over for fun, you know, this season. But you know, no, he, uh, he did he did a cracking job at Newport. I think it was just one of those where his time had come, if you know what I mean. He made some interesting comments, didn't he? I think about the fact that he didn't feel like he could take the club any further. I think he was a bit frustrated with the the, the, the lack of progress with things off the field. I think he felt things were moving I, a little bit too was, slowly. I think he was quite similar to Greg Abbott. Hmm. At us, and that last season for Abbott was just that little bit too much. 
Yeah, I, I, I feel like it's one of those ones. I see what you mean, actually. It's a good comparison. That I think what the difference is, he made the right judgment to go, it, it, I can't take it any further now. I need to leave. He he left out of his own accord and he basically resigned, essentially, didn't he? And said, I'm, I'm going to move on now rather than you know drag it out any further than he had to. So I think quite smart in that sense to, to realise that, you know, you know to, you have to step away to, to further your career as much as anything, really, don't you? Whereas Abbott, just plugged along, didn't he? And he should have left that 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 2012 13 season. At the end of that, he probably should have gone. Thanks, but I'm I'm going to move on now and try and get a job yeah. elsewhere. But um, but yeah, no, I think you're right, and an odd choice of Walsall, isn't it? Because they're a club that have really stagnated in recent seasons, aren't they, Mike? They've. I think we all sort of agreed in pre-season, didn't we? We felt Taylor was an interesting appointment, but the quality of the. The, the plays they had in the squad is I mean I'm looking through the squad now I'm jumping ahead a little bit here but looking at the squad there's not a lot of quality in there is there really no there's quite a bit of hardened league two experience mm. but there's not a lot of that sort of quality that you need to push on really yeah I mean I'm looking Kinsella and, and Labadee are the two that stand out aren't they they're two sort of experienced mm. players well, Lab- Labadee's, the one that, Labadee's the one that really stands out and not Obviously, he was at uh, Newport under Flynn for a bit as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Obviously, he left them to go to, 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 to Walsall. It'll be interesting to see how they yeah. get on these days. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was a third consecutive defeat actually for them in midweek. They they lost 1-0 to Rochdale thanks to a Conor Grant goal. Um, prior to that, actually, their form wasn't too bad. They, I think that they'd only lost 1-9 in nine under Flynn. So it clearly had an effect. And I think maybe it's just the fact that they've, similar to us, they've got themselves safe and now the players are like, well, don't need to try as hard now, do we really? It's, you, you sometimes see that, don't you really? Especially when you've mm-hmm. not really got any chance of a playoff place or anything like that. You find teams struggle a little bit. Um, looking through this squad then, basically, is while we're here. I mean, like you said, you mentioned there in terms of experience, they've got Matt Sadler there who barely plays these days. I think he's more of a coach, isn't he? Manny Monter is, you know, a player... This level, who's you know been brilliant for Tramway in the past, not done as well there. I don't think it, it, it looks like one or two of the experienced have missed a few games. You know, Zach Mills has been around the yeah. league. He's only played eight games. Uh, Stephen Ward is massively experienced, thirty six years yeah. old. Mm. He's he's missed a hell of a lot recently. Yeah. In fact, the last game was his first game back after a good two months out. Well, that show goes to show, doesn't it? Because I think we, actually we did say in the summer, I think we felt he was a really good signing for them. But he's yeah, that, that's the risk when you sign a player that age. They potentially are going to miss quite a few games with injuries, yeah. aren't they? In attack, they've got a few decent players, haven't they? I suppose Devante Rodney's always done fairly well against us. I mean, Lee Tomlin's a brilliant footballer on his day, but he's not played for a long time again. Like, no, like I think he's been out. He's, he's been, he's out been well injured clubs, a lot, and yeah, so it's been tough for him. I and mean, Connor Wilkinson was excellent for Orient last season. Not quite hit the same height of the Walsall, but still probably been one of their better players. Yeah. And George Miller. They haven't got a massive well. squad, have they? No, it, it's tight, but they've they've always relied on a lot of young players coming through. Yeah, but I yeah. don't think they've been. I don't think they've been producing those young players at the same quality that they have for quite a while. It's also the, 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 it's a bit cheesy, but they're in an ideal place to pick up from Villa, Birmingham, Wolves, West Brom, aren't they? You know. Well, you mm. mean, yeah, you say that. I'm looking they should the, be anyway. Looking through the squad. They've not got a single player on, on loan from a Midlands club except for yeah. Tyrese Shade from Leicester City. George Miller from um, from Barnsley looked a good player, actually, when he played against yeah, him in the yeah. past. He's, he's looked okay. He was a berry, I think, back in the day, wasn't mm. he? But they've got a young lad on loan from Man United, Reese Devine, and a keeper on loan from Brighton. I think he's the second choice, Carl Rushworth. So, yeah, they've, they've maybe struggled to get some of those loan players in, in in recent seasons. And you'd think someone like Matt Taylor would have had the contacts to get a few in. You know, having had a, a fairly decent playing career, but then maybe you need someone like a Flynn who's who's been a manager for three or four years to actually get some of those players. And sometimes I you mentioned Reese Devine; he's not played for two months, and then he played at Rochdale last week. He must have been injured as well. Like I said, maybe well, he doesn't maybe... say he's been injured, but that's, that's not always. Yeah, maybe maybe it is an issue of injuries. Maybe of, of late, that's yeah. why there's been a few problems. But yeah, it's one of those ones you look at and you think of all the remaining games. This is the one I actually looked at and thought, other than maybe Stevenage, you can get three points from this. This yeah. is one we should be aiming to get three points from at the yeah. least. Especially if they're taking the foot off the gas because they think that they're safe. Yeah. You know. You've got to look at that because obviously the game on Easter Monday, which we'll get onto in a minute, is, is a much tougher game, basically. It's arguably mm-hmm. the, the hardest game we've got left, actually, against Mansfield. Um, 
Well, before we talk about Mansfield, we, we, we like to do it this way, Roman. There's two games. We like to talk about United before we go on to talk about the second game because that's the next game coming up where people are going to be playing. Um, injuries wise, Callum Guy and Joel Senior remain out. I'm presuming the guy's out for the rest of the season. For Jamie Devitt there. was on the grass with a ball today, but uh, he was, yeah. It's just. He, he might well, sneak back for one. Well, Simpson has said that he, he hopes he'll be back before the end of the season. So I wonder yeah. if maybe you're looking at the Stevenage and the maybe at the best on the bench for Harrogate, possibly. And maybe then you get the game in the team for Stevenage and um, yeah. and Brighton. I mean, if he's fit for those last two games, play him because we, we need someone in midfield of his quality mm. really to, to help us a little bit. Um, but yeah, uh, Dickinson, we originally thought it was going to be a doubt for this game, but I've just seen Paul Simpson actually said this afternoon that he, he's fit and he'll be. Raring to go for the game against um, Walsall on Good Friday. Um, in terms of the team, lads, I mean, Dan, would you? What would you do in terms of freshening up a little bit, maybe? Uh, you wonder if Arm is the obvious one to come back in. Mm. Maybe Mellish back to left centre back with McDonald not playing well. But it's it's middle of the park where we still struggle, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think Devine's doing okay there. I think actually keeping him in is probably the better. I don't. He's the only one really left who's actually a central midfielder. And I'd, rather, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd rather just keep playing him for now. Just, just yeah. play, him, oh, play yeah. him through yeah. and get him into a little bit of form before the end of the season, yeah. really. It's the best way to do it. But yeah, I mean, I tend to agree with you. I mean, you'd maybe freshen up in attack, maybe, in terms of to give Dennis a rest, maybe. But then who do you bring in? I mean, I'd be tempted to bring Alessandra in for Dennis, maybe. Yeah. Someone who's a little bit trickier, but... Simpson maybe just doesn't seem to think he fits into the way he wants to play. He's been he's been very complimentary about Alessandro actually, hasn't he? He said that you know he's working hard and in training and there's no issues. With Do you know he hasn't played a single minute for us since Salford on the first of February? Wow, that's incredible, isn't it? Really, and we've always he's thought been he's on the bench know. eight times and out the squad five times. Blimey. I, that is quite surprised that actually had, and, and he, he, that he, he was only back for five games after injury wasn't he you yeah know? got that vital header against Crawley to get us a point against them as well which yeah. did help mm-hmm. a little bit um, anything you do to change it up Mike I think just what Dan said and indeed what I said last week is put Mellish in that left centre back role and hopefully put Armour back in or you know even if you're not putting Armour back in you know I'd, I'd rather see Mellish in left centre back role with Dickinson still there than carry on with what we did on Saturday so yeah would you push Dickinson to midfield do you maybe give Riley a run in midfield for the first time in a while yeah it would, it would, be, it would be good to see Riley back in um, but yeah for some reason Simo maybe doesn't fancy him for whatever reason I don't know hmm. Tough one to judge, isn't it? I, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to see Divine as more the holding, and then maybe Riley and Gibson. Yeah, I Give, so. given Dickinson's had a knock, maybe a game on the bench would be better for him. Could 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 well be really maybe maybe just bring him on as a sub later on for for Armour, maybe to have a bit of a run yeah. at him possibly, but. But there you go. Right. Well, let's move on to talk about Mansfield then before we do the predictions at the end. Um. Yeah, so this game, it's Brunton Park on Monday, 3 o'clock kickoff, Easter Monday. Um, yeah, it's a really tough game, this one. It looks like it really, doesn't it? Because they're, they're flying, at the, you know, pushing for that top three place, potentially with battling with Port Vale, I think, for third place. Um, referee for this game, Scott Oldham. He's one of his regular, regular referees, doesn't he? I think as a Lancashire ref. Um, it's his fifth season as an EFL referee. He's taken charge of 33 games so far this season, handing out a nice round 99 yellow cards, a free game, basically, on average. And two red cards in that time. So he's not really card happy in terms of the red card, which is good to see. Um, last took charge of the United game for the 1 0 win over Walsall, funny enough, uh, back in November, where Tristan Abrahams got his. Was that his last goal for his Abrahams? I think it would be, wouldn't well. it? Mm. Might be your last ever goal for us, the way things are going, but there you go. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's referees. Head to head wise, it's the 85th meeting between the two sides. United have won 32, uh, 19 have been a draw, and the Stags have won 33. So we could draw back level with the Stags in terms of head to heads. Um, last season, final position, 16th place. Really poor considering the investment they made into their squad, wasn't it, really? we, I think everyone expects them to do a lot better than they did. This season, they, they certainly have turned it around a bit, haven't they? Fourth place on 69 points with uh, from 40 games. They're 14 places and 22 points ahead of United, having played a game less. Um, manager, I think we, we were in agreement over the summer about this one, Dan, weren't we, that Nigel Clough's was arguably 
the best manager in League Two, wasn't he? Really, in terms of experience and what he's done in the past, he's he's yeah. someone who's been there and done that, hasn't he? Yeah, uh, he's. His record speaks for itself, you know, Burton, uh, Derby, Sheffield United, Burton again. Uh, I think when he left Burton, it was sort of the right time for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he, he, he stepped down because of COVID, you know, he said, don't pay me, you know, other yeah. people deserve pay, yeah. which is a brilliant thing to do, yeah. you know. And then he obviously... been in that situation where he could afford to do that, really. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. But... Yeah, 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 but uh, no, he's... He came in and last season with Mansfield, he came in, in, I think it was just before Christmas, was it? Yeah, I think it was... I would uh, say November, December? October and, last year. Yeah, and I, think, I think it was just a case of, you know, it was always just going to be, you know, steady the ship, getting ready for this season, which is, uh, which is done. But I think they yeah. won like seven or eight on the bounce, didn't they, when he first came in? Mm. Yeah, they did. He did really well when they first came in, and then obviously they had a bit of a sort of mm. struggle towards the end of the season. And I think at that point, he was just basically weeding out who he didn't want in the squad, wasn't he? He was sort of looking through and working out who 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 am I going to keep in, who am I not, and then probably going to look and see who he could take from Burton Albion because I think I think he's signed about five or six players from them, hasn't he? Basically to sort of rebuild the squad at Field Mill and. Um, and yeah, like you said, I mean, 23 years as a manager he's been now, and he's barely had a break in that time as well. When you look at it, actually, he's pretty pretty much been in charge of football clubs the whole time. Mm. Derby did a pretty good job. He got close to the, the Premier League with them, I seem to remember. Sheffield United, I think, was always a bit tougher, really, in the circumstances at the time. Burton's way has made his name, basically, twice. You know, the job he's done there has been incredible. And there's an argument Mansfield are a slightly bigger club than... In fact, I don't think there's even an argument they are a slightly bigger club than Burton Albion they're probably the right size club for him really at this time and in terms of making a step up from Burton even though Burton are at a higher level they don't get partic- particularly big crowds do they I don't think so it's a, it's an interesting one for him and, and, and like I said he seems to have, have got them really flying now and got the players in that he wants really to, to do that last time out I mean they couldn't have picked a much easier game really to warm up for, for us with could they uh, playing almost relegated scum form. Not quite there yet, but I, f- I think they're pretty much going to be relegated on Friday, aren't they? I think if the results go against them. Um, yep, yeah, 4-0 win. Uh, goals from Anthony Grant own goal, Steve McLaughlin, Ryan Stirk and Stephen Quinn. Um, in the form table, they're like the league table, they're fourth at the moment. Their last six games are 1-1 one, one drawn, 1-1 one, lost 1, and that defeat was against Forest Green Rovers. There's no disgrace in losing to them. I mean, they've picked up form again, basically, haven't they? So, you know, not a massive surprise. Just, I've just got the league table up there. Scunthorpe need to win, basically. basically. Yeah. Oh, well, they, they, if they a draw, it. it's the goal difference is that bad. It's yeah, they not happening. They're done, aren't they? Basically, um, just waiting for Barrow to join them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Only two to one for relegation now. Uh, Remember, that's all be... all at nines and sevens. It's going to be tight. It's going to be tight. Um, quick look through their squad before they do the match predictions, then, guys. Um, so much more quality than Walsall, isn't there? <laughs> when you look through it, I mean, mm. experience. I mean, in terms of goalkeepers, Marek Stech has always been a fairly decent keeper at this level, but he's second choice now to Nathan Bishop, who's on loan from Man United. A player that we were allegedly looking at in the summer, weren't we, Dan? I seem to remember. He was linked, wasn't he? And we ended up with Lucas Jensen instead. Yeah, that'll do. Yeah, let's leave that there, shall Simple. we? Um, <laughs> uh, but I mean, I mean, looking through defence, I mean, John Joe O'Till, he's a proper nasty sod him isn't he really mm. all elbows all you know little words in here and there little di- digs in the ribs and stuff but what what a great player at this level really isn't he I think Dan you've said it before Northampton Tiny was excellent wasn't he I seem to remember your mates there all yeah the, a few of my he's a bit of a legend at uh, Northampton you know he's he's just a proper yeah proper proper good <laughs> centre back and just a proper player really for that level I guess um other, other defenders I'm looking at here, I mean, there's a few players I don't actually recognise that well, but I mean, Kieran Wallace, they signed from uh, Burton as well. He's always been a good player there. I think Ryan Burke, they signed from Birmingham City. He's done really well. Um, and in, in terms of the midfield, I mean, that I mean, it's packed with quality, isn't it, Mike? I mean, you look through it. Yeah. James Perch is someone who's played at Premier League level and he's, you know, an experienced head in there. He can sit in front of the defence and screen it a bit. Uh, I mean... Stephen Quinn, we've, we've, we've said before what an excellent signing he was from Burton. Mm-hmm. You know, played for Ireland before. You know, he's played for Hull City in the Premier League, I seem to remember as well, I think. Uh, George Lapsley someone I've always really liked this level. But, I mean, the one that really stands out is Matty Longstaff, isn't it? 
I know. I, I couldn't believe that they pulled that off, but there you go. Because he's, he, he, he's played quite a few games for Newcastle, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. And, and he was linked with, a, like a, was it a £30 million move done to Manchester United at one point? I mean, yeah, that was, a yeah. lot of that was the agent talk, I think. But he you know, yeah. scored a couple it, of goals it, against them. He was linked in a swap deal with Everton for Calvert-Lewin, I think, as well. Something mad like that. But mm. it, it just it's just a weird way his career's gone, isn't it? We Again, another player we were linked with in January, weren't we? I don't think he was ever going to come to a relegation battle in, in League 2 where they're going to play a fight in League 2. But but it, it's weird that he, he's dropped down as far as League 2 instead of like Championship or League 1, considering you know he was playing regular football for Newcastle. Well, fairly regular football for Newcastle just a couple of years ago. It's a real force. Well, the one race. that stands out for me is Jamie Murphy. Yeah, again, he's mm-hmm. moved on to attack quite well there. I mean, he's, he's, he's missed the last couple of games, the last three games. Is, I think he possibly got injured because he was substituted after 23 minutes when they drew at Hartlepool. So he must have a knock. But, you know, you look at the clubs Jamie Murphy's played for, started off at Motherwell, Sheffield United, Brighton, went to Rangers, and he was at Burton. Then he went back up to Hibs. So they've managed to persuade him to come down from him. So that's, that's, yeah. These are League One signings, not League Two. Yeah, definitely, definitely, absolutely. I mean, you, you mentioned Jamie Murphy there, but I mean, looking at actually every one of their attackers, I mean, Jimmy Knowles, I don't yeah. know so much about it. I think they've signed him for non-league football, possibly. But I mean, Reese Oates was top scorer for Hartlepool last season in the National League, wasn't he? And that was a, seen as a big sign in the summer. Lucas Aikens has played like five or six seasons of Championship football with Burton Albion. Um Danny Johnson was a player who scored a load of goals for late on last season. Not done as well at Field Mill, but you know, that's probably because the other players around him have done so much better. Jordan Barry on his day is an absolute handful. He really is at this level. His days are sometimes few and far between, but he seems to have found a bit of form for, for the Stags now. And Oliver Hawkins, on loan from, from um, Ipswich Town, seems to have done okay there as well. I mean, I'm not saying it's scary, but you look at it, you think, well, this is going to be a really tough game, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, uh, I'd take a point right now against them, to be quite honest. You know, it's they're, they're going to be, I think they're going to be on an exit level. I do. Yeah. Mm. And, that, and then they're, they're really battling for that third place with, with Port Vale. Yeah. And then Port Vale have found an incredible run of form, haven't they? Especially with, you know, the difficult times that Daryl Clark has, has had in, in the last few months. And we obviously wish him all the best in his family. And yeah, it's, it's incredible, really, that, that those two clubs have just come out of nowhere because. There was other clubs like Tramir up there. You thought, oh, they're going to be nailed on for the third place. But no, they've dropped off. And those two seem to be the ones in pole position with Mansfield having that game in hand to get them back into it as well. Going to be really interesting to see what happens in the final few weeks of the season in, in League Two, definitely. Let's do match predictions then. Um, Dan, do you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to win at Walsall. And I'm going to go for 2 nil, And I'm going to go for Christian Dennis. And Danny Devine to get a goal. Oh, it's a And then goal. Mansfield, I'm going to go for a 1 1 draw. And I'm going to have Amari Patrick getting the goal. Oh, there you go. Mike, what are you going for? I'm going to go for a 3 1 win against Walsall with an Amari Patrick hat trick. There we go. That That's a headline, isn't it? Yeah. And um, then I'm going to go for a 2 1 win against Mansfield. I think. They'll underestimate us a little bit, and I'll go for Mellish and Feeney to get the goals. Oh, there you go. I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go for a free one as well, Mike at uh, Walsall. But I'm going to go for uh, Patrick Brace, and then Dinal Simeon will get the other goal, and he'll be he'll be <laughs> he'll be, a, he'll be, a, he'll be a, um, Charlotte Richard Services by by the time uh, the final whistle is finished celebrating. Somebody's finished celebrating. Um, I, I, I think I think the last game of the season, if we get a penalty and he's not scored by then, yeah, he should be it. allowed to take it. Absolutely, he'd absolutely blaze it over the bar. You can guarantee it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Hit, hit um, the top of that little double decker stand. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Um, so yeah, that, that, that go go for that one and that one. I'm sort of minded to go for a defeat against Manifield because I think it will be tough. But actually, no, I'm going to go for a 1-1 draw as well. And I'm going to go for a goal from Morgan Feeney. Header from a corner. I think he'll get a header from a corner for that one. Um, should we? Before we go to the X-Files, should we get the answer to the question, Dan? Yeah, Mike, have you got any us. idea? Um, the only ones I can think of, I think Hayden White. Hayden like... White's the one I had, basically. Hayden White, yeah. that was it. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, there you go. So the, the, there, may be, there may be more, but... Uh... 
That was literally because, done off a quick Wikipedia search. Well, because <laughs> I was thinking Jordan Cook as well, but he never actually played for us, did he, sir? Jordan Cook, I mean Andy Cook. No, yeah. Andy, Andy Cook, yeah. Andy Cook, Andy Cook, yeah, technically never played a first-team game for us. Mm. So you, you're right there in terms of that, but there you go. Because um, Jordan Cook did play for Walsall, didn't he, I think, for a brief Yeah, he did, time. but I don't yes, think he played for Mansfield. Yeah. No, he never played for Mansfield, but there you go. Uh, right, well, let's quickly bash through the X-Files. There's a bit to fit in, Dan, but I'm sure we can get it all done pretty quickly, yeah? Yeah, uh, X-Files, uh, I was doing this on a... Airport transfer on Saturday. I ruined it for you because uh, I, I gave you one of them and you were like, I'm looking yeah, for it. Yeah, no, like, you were at my equilibrium while counting uh, <laughs> petrol stations on the main road in Turkey. If you haven't got a Turkey, just keep an eye out for how many petrol stations there are. It's incredible. Anyways, <laughs> back to the football. Saturday, Oliver Norwood scored for Sheffield United in a 1 0 win at QPR. Sorry, that was in the midweek, wasn't it? Last week, yeah. So we, yeah, we did we get to do it last week. Early, early, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cole Stockton scored in Morecambe's 2-1 win in that midweek and then a stunning volley in the 2-1 defeat at Cambridge. <laughs> Absolutely it's incredible definitely one, goal. Definitely mm. one to uh, look at. I mean, genuinely, yeah. he, could, he could have his own league one goal of the season competition with yeah. goals yeah. a season. Ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, David Simonton scored in Workington's 4-1 win at Bootle in midweek last week. Uh, on the Saturday, Jamie Proctor, still in good form. He got a brace for Port Vale in the 3-2 over... Oldham, it seems to be a hell of a game, that. Mm. Uh, Tom Lawrence scored for Derby in the 2-1 defeat at Swansea. I think it was a penalty as well. Yeah. He, he is a rare visitor to this part. Corey Evans you say rare. scored in Sunderland's 2-1 win against Oxford. You say rare. I'm sure we had him a few weeks ago as well, actually. You know, I think he's had a couple yeah, recently. He's, he's, not, he's not regular, regular. Yeah, no, no. Uh, Aaron Hayden scored in Wrexham's 3-2 win over Eastleigh. Another incredible and game. And then <laughs> to the Gateshead game we mentioned earlier, ex-players galore. Uh, Adam Campbell got a brace Kedwin Scott scored and George Glendon scored for Chester I think it was a cross that was over hit wasn't it and went straight yeah. to the back of the net or something like that that one yeah uh, no midweek that we've noticed yet it's only Wednesday night now I yeah. don't think there's anyone unless uh, no. there's a random Champions League pops up tonight uh, other news Harry McCurdy was fined a grand by the FA for Chatting shit on social media, no change there. No. Uh, Paddy Madden was named the National League Player of the Month for March, and Kedwin Scott was named the National League North Player of the Month. Yeah, good stuff. That and one, one we did actually miss is Jared Bronthwaite played for Everton, didn't he? In their free team yeah. defeat at Burnley. Yeah. I mean, no, not a great game to come into that for him, was it really? It was a, you know, I wasn't saying it was a must win game now because they managed to be in Man United, but, but there you go. It's, uh, Another learning curve for Big Jared, and uh, hopefully he'll keep his progress going. That's it then, guys. Um, episode 99 out of the way. The big 100 next week. Um, thanks again for both of you giving up your time. Thanks once again to the London Brand for sponsoring us. Um, in terms of upcoming episodes, obviously we mentioned the fact that we've got the 100 episode coming up next week. We're hopefully going to try and get all three of us on it. It's going to be a challenge, I think, because... Mike, you're working after Monday, aren't you? So it's going to be. See how yeah, well, I'm on the I'm on the morning on Tuesday, so Ooh, I can maybe do Tuesday have... afternoon. Well, we maybe. might do a Tuesday afternoon or evening one. Maybe we'll have to wait and see what happens with that one. Could work for me that, but uh, we'll on. keep you all in suspense. Indeed, we'll <laughs> have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, in terms of that as well, uh, keep an eye out in the uh, news and sound next week because there's going to be a little feature on on the podcast in there about the hundredth episode. So me and Dan sat down and had a chat with John Coleman recently, didn't we? So. Uh, that should be a, a good little piece, hopefully. But um, but yeah, that's it. Um, we're obviously we're going to start planning as well for next season soon. Going to look to tighten up the episodes, change things a little bit. Looking potentially at doing a Patreon. It won't be like an expensive ten pound a month one. It's you're looking at a few quid maybe. So we're going to see what we can do with that, aren't we? And uh, hopefully yeah. that means we can get a bit more content and a bit more special content out for you as well, guys. Thanks once again for your time. Um, up the blues. Up the blues. Up the blues.